G'day! This is an update on the Hendrix Hive. This video is an update of all of the things that have happened since the last video. First, for new viewers, a quick recap on what is the Hendrix Hive. Scott Hendrix is a beekeeper in Northern Ontario. He's also a YouTuber, has a YouTube channel called Beekeeping in Northern Ontario. Scott's having a go at designing a configuration of a standard Langstroth hive that allows you to inspect the brood chamber without removing the honey supers in the summertime. Your brood chamber sits in this bottom box here. The bees can come up and into the honey supers up here. This box here is just a spacer. For many beekeepers, having to take those honey supers off is prohibitive. For commercial beekeepers, it's a problem because it's time consuming. For hobby beekeepers, there's a lot of weight involved in big heavy supers. And so as a result, many people don't even look at the brood chamber during the summer. That does mean that a small percentage of hives will develop problems that could have been fixed, but which aren't identified until after harvest time. I've done several videos already which outline what I'm doing to try and help Scott out. I've built one of the designs that he came up with and put bees in it here in New Zealand so that we could watch what would happen to it over the summertime because obviously he's in the middle of his winter and can't be trying it out. And a lot has happened. So I just apologise for looking down a bit during this video. I'm watching the footage that you're seeing going on in the background so that I can do a voiceover. Back in November, the first issue arose. The hive started bearding strongly. I fixed that quite quickly by adding another box on and also by putting ventilation under the lid. And within 12 hours, that bearding had gone and didn't come back. However, I checked the brood and I did notice some queen cups with eggs in them. It did appear that that hive was superseding. However, mid-December, I came out, checked the hive on a hot day and found this. It appeared as though the hive had been bearding, that the beard had fallen onto the ground. And at first I thought, it's okay, they'll walk back into the hive. They had walked across onto the stand and they looked like they were coming up. However, later that evening, I went out to check to see what was going on and they hadn't walked back in, they were still clinging to the stand. I put a platform in front of the hive and started scooping the bees up and dropping them onto that platform so that they could walk back in. This is getting quite late in the evening so it was almost dark and uh, that's why I didn't film it. I found the queen in amongst those bees that had come out of the hive. I really didn't understand what was happening here. Normally when, to the best of my knowledge, when bees beard, the queen doesn't come out of the hive. The fact that they had dropped onto the ground and then not gone back into the hive made me wonder whether what I was seeing was some kind of a half-hearted swarm. So to cover my bases, instead of putting, letting those bees walk back into the hive, they weren't showing any signs of walking back in anyway, I actually put them into a nuke and relocated them. Figuring that if there were queen cells inside that hive, then maybe it was in swarm mode and I needed to check that the next day during daylight. When I got in the next morning and pulled brood frames, sure enough, what do I find but a whole lot of queen cups. Now I'm still a little bit confused at this stage. The queen cups are not typical swarm cell cups. That one there you see is at the bottom of the frame, but many of the cups that I found, and there were quite a few in the hive, were high up, looking like supersedure cells. So I decided that I would simply leave the queen, the previous queen, in the nuke that I'd put her into, and that I'd let those uh, queen cups, or the queen cups that I left behind, emerge, and let that hive requeen itself. I then checked to see what was going on upstairs and there were bees up there, by upstairs I mean up in the honey supers, there were bees in there and they were working the frames and putting in some nectar but they were really, the activity was only limited to two or three frames directly above the gap in the hive. Things didn't look that good. Then early January came round 
and I found this. I came out into the backyard, it's full of bees, I had a look, and it's the Hendrix site. Now at this point, I was completely surprised. I had thought that by removing the queen and reducing the number of queen cups, queen cells in the hive, that I would have taken any swarm instinct away. Clearly I was wrong. So the hive hit the trees. I didn't film it, but I climbed up into the tree, I gathered that swarm, put it into a box and moved it away. Of course, what did that mean? That meant that what's left now is a depleted hive. After all that carry on, what's happened to the Hendrix hive? Let's open it up and have a look. You see that I've got a top entrance here that was in an effort to get them to be, uh, get more ventilation to cut down all of that bearding that was happening. Of course I know what's going on in here. The answer is pretty much nothing. Very few bees in the top boxes. Of course when they swarmed they would have taken a lot of resources with them. They are putting some nectar in these top boxes, but the population down below, post-swarm, is nowhere near enough to support the thought of making honey this season. So I'm going to reconfigure this. I'm going to break this down, reconfigure it back to a normal configuration, and move on to Mark II, which you haven't seen yet, which is right there. This is the Mark II. It's sitting sideways to the Mark I, but that's only because I haven't taken the time to build a tunnel across the bottom, which would allow me to turn it and sit it in the same orientation. I haven't done that because I want to try it out. But let's break it down so you can see inside and see how this one works. It's still a Hendrix hive. It's just got one significant difference. As I've already said, the population in the Mark I Hendrix hive was insufficient for me to get an, any hope of having honey laid down during the flow. We're in the middle of the flow, so what I've done is I've taken a strong hive that was laying down honey and I've transferred it into this configuration. This top honey super was put on, it's completely new and empty. The bees are already coming up into it, but it's undrawn frames so really what I'm hoping for is to get these frames drawn out maybe some honey in them but if they can get if they can draw it then that will tell me that this is working this next box already has quite a lot of honey laid down you see that this outside frame they're just drawing they've drawn one side of it out I'll actually transfer that right now inwards a wee bit so they draw out the other, that other side but if I move in a few frames and show you what state it was in this was only put together yesterday so you'll see that this box this honey super is nearly fully drawn out and that's the way it was when I put it into this configuration. So my assessment of whether or not this, is, this method is working is going to hinge around whether the top box gets worked well. But of course you don't know how the bees are getting from the brood chamber here into the honey boxes. So let me pull it down a little bit further and demonstrate. I'm going to drop that half drawn frame into the middle to encourage them to finish drawing it out properly. Let me first show you that I can lift this lid here and I'm straight into the brood chamber as before. I'm going to leave that off. If 
Okay, so now you can see the difference. Instead of this section here being a spacer, as it was on the Mark 1, this is a deep box full of drawn frames. This would be my second deep in a double deep hive. But I'm still running a single deep brood chamber. Over here, this will fill up, this already has filled up with honey. When the winter comes along, I will give them this whole box. So they'll be overwintered as double deep, except that it's a horizontal hive. So there'll be a lid on there, or two lids actually. I'll explain that later. So what I'm going to do now, actually I'll start here. If I just pull this frame, see that's, uh, that's full of nectar. And pull this frame, which is in the brew chamber. They're still drawing that one out. Putting some honey on the side of the brood chamber. And the reason I pulled those two out is so that I can pull this out and show you what it is. This is a queen excluder. A vertical queen excluder that slides into place. Now I've made it so it's removable so that I can remove it in the winter time to allow these bees to move backwards and forwards across here. We don't last thing I want to happen is for the queen to get left here after they've eaten all of the honey in here out and if the cluster moves across onto this side the queen could get left behind. So it's important that that queen excluder can get removed. And I've just discovered that when I put it back in there are bees underneath. I doubt that my microphone picked up the squishing sound. So I'll just reassemble it. Right, we had a brief intermission there while I went to get the smoker. Top it up with fuel, get back into business. This box is made of 30 mil timber, which I didn't bother planing down to its normal size. I thought the extra thickness would be good. But of course that means that it's wider, slightly wider that way than a normal box is. Uh, so it doesn't quite fit the dimension, which is why I've uh, planed a little section off the corners so that any water coming down will run out rather than running into the box. I forgot to do that before I assembled it and put the bees in. So this morning I came out here and planed those edges off with the bees in the hive. Let me tell you, Planing bits off a hive full of bees is a great way to work them up, to wind them up. So now, there's also something missing here which I've got to screw in place, and that's the bar that goes across there to get the water to shed onto the roof and go out that way. This is the brood chamber, I can access it without removing the honey supers. The bees can move horizontally into that bottom box, from there they can go up. Is it going to be better than the Mark 1? Time will tell. That's what this business is about. Put the bees in and see what the bees do. Do I think the Mark 1 was a failure? Or did I just have some swarmy bees that didn't want to stay in their box? I'll let you decide that. That's, uh, that's not a given that, it's, that that method doesn't work. We'll see if Scott tries it in his summer, which is coming up, and see if he can make it work. So 
So this lid is just built on top of an ordinary mm -hmm. inner cover so that it's got shims around the outside edges like on the other hive to ensure that the bees have got some bee space. It's also been built to be the right width so that it sheds water down there and out there and as I said there needs to be a bar screwed on here which I'll do this afternoon. We haven't got any rain in our forecast for a day or two. So here it is the Mark II from what could be considered failure of the Mark I comes another version and I think that epitomizes beekeeping. Failure is not an end, failure is simply an opportunity to try something different. Thanks for watching.